Hi guys, welcome to Cryptids Canada. I hope everybody is having a great day. Um, oh Lord, Lord, Lord. I finished this video about an hour ago. I was editing it when I discovered that my neighbor's dog barked continuously from the get-go. Um, literally, you could hear it sometimes over my voice. I couldn't believe it. So I am redoing this video. I hope you guys can hear just me. I've called the neighbor. She finally answered and I've asked her to please keep her dog inside. We'll see how long that lasts. She She's in denial. She doesn't think her dog barks as loud as I'm saying. She's always trying to say it's somebody else's dog. But my office window kind of juts up to the back of her property. And for some reason, her dog likes to sit right there and watch what's going on in my backyard. I'm not kidding. Anyways, hopefully we can get through it again. This time quieter. Turn my air conditioner off too, so we don't have to hear that humming in the background. Oh my goodness. Okay, so I am going to read a couple of stories from Bigfoot in Kentucky. Of course, from my favorite author, Barton Nunnally. Um, oh, and just in case I forget, at the end, can you guys uh, give me a thumbs up or a like if you enjoy the story? And if you really enjoy the story, can you share it? That really helps me with the algorithms and putting my video in your recommendations, basically. Okay, guys. So, uh, yeah, we're going to get right to it. And the first one is Carter County. Okay. Many locations throughout the state are what is known to paranormal experts as window areas, where multiple seemingly unrelated phenomena tend to overlap. Anything goes in these locations, and it usually does. Carter County was formed in 1878 and now has a population of just under 30,000 people. This eastern Kentucky province is home to Carter Caves State Resort Park, nearly 2,000 acres of some of the most picturesque views of the country, impressive underground cave systems, the largest national rock bridge in the state, and numerous unexplained events, including Bigfoot sightings dating back to the 1960s and, likely, much earlier. Fortean events appear to have an unnatural preference for the town of Olive Hill, situated on Tigarts Creek. The creek was named for an early Kentucky explorer, Michael Tigart, who later earned the inevitable distinction of drowning to death in it. On Saturday, August 9, 1958, two-year-old Debbie Ann Greenwell disappeared from her isolated Olive Hill location near the 54th Acre Water Reservoir on the outskirts of town. Her and her family had just moved into the house that same day. She was playing outside alone when her mother, still busy from the move, went inside the house at 7.45 p.m. When she returned 20 minutes later, little Debbie was nowhere to be found. There were several other people inside the house at the time, and Within seconds, they were all outside screaming for Debbie Ann, but there was no answer from the vast stretches of dense brush and forest that surrounded the house. After a thorough search of the immediate area produced no results and no replies from the missing girl, local authorities were called, who in turn notified the state police. An extensive search of the area soon followed. Volunteers scoured the countryside for any sign of the missing girl. They found nothing. As per standard operating procedure, the search was confined to a one-mile radius of the Greenwell home. How far could a two-year-old baby travel on her own in such a short length of time? Not that far, they were sure. This fact 
kept them going, even as the search was hampered by two severe storm systems that pummeled the Olive Hill area over the next 48 hours. Still, try as they might, searchers could find no clues as to the missing girl's whereabouts. Finally, after three days of fruitless searching, the police were convinced that the girl was no longer in the hills surrounding her home, concluding that the child had been kidnapped. The sheriff's office then called in the FBI to assist them in the matter, which was a curious thing to do since the feds do not involve themselves in missing persons cases. Nevertheless, four agents were immediately dispatched to the scene and remained there, but there was nothing anyone could do to bring that bring back little Debbie Ann Greenwall. The National Guard was brought in. Authorities dragged the reservoir and found nothing. The best bloodhounds were delivered from Lexington, but they failed to pick up the girl's scent. She had vanished without a trace. But the search continued. Then, at around 2 p.m., four days after her disappearance, a National Guardsman searched through the brush in an area that had already been searched 150 feet from the reservoir and only about three-quarters of a mile from the Greenwall home, heard the unmistakable sound of a child crying. He followed the sound and there, sitting on the ground, bruised and scratched, with berry stains all over her face, was Debbie Ann. All her clothes, even her shoes, were missing. The National Guardsman carried her down to the lake and delivered her by boat to a waiting ambulance. She was immediately examined by a pediatrician named Dr. William Schnitzer from Ashland. Schnitzer was quoted in the Park City News on August 13, 1958, as stating that the girl must have lived on berries, which grow thick and wild in that area. There was little evidence of malnutrition, although Debbie was very hungry. An article in the August 14, 1958 edition of the Charlton Gazette declared the child was naked, her blonde curls matted and body scratched, bruised and insect bitten, but she was declared in remarkably good condition. Fortunately for the Greenwell family, this story had such a happy ending, but many questions remain. How could a baby survive in such a rugged, mountainous environment? for four days, and B, cuts and abrasives aside, in such remarkable condition? How could the initial searchers fail to find her so close to her home? How did authorities not see her from only 150 feet away while dragging the lake? How did she know the berries were edible? And finally, what happened to her clothes and shoes, which the searchers also failed to see or find? Were they washed away in the thunderstorms? Considering the evidence in this case, or lack thereof, it might be only logical to assume that the local police had been correct in their initial assessment of the case that Debbie Ann had been kidnapped and then returned by whom or what. It has long been noted that Bigfoot creatures seem to be attracted to human children. For what reasons? We may never know, but there does seem to be some strange connections there. Was Bigfoot responsible for kidnapping and then returning young Debbie Ann? You decide. Another strange incident that involved young children reportedly took place in Carter County, Kentucky. I would experience four encounters with the human-like creature, which strongly fits the description of a Bigfoot or Sasquatch, Though, at the time of the first two encounters, I didn't even know what a Bigfoot or Sasquatch was, claimed one Carter County residence in February of 2011. My first encounter took place in 1979, when I was about nine years old. My younger sister and I were in the woods behind our house playing. We had been swinging on a vine, going from one side of a draw to the other, my sister slipped on the vine, causing severe rope burns in her hands, and she fell down into the draw and started crying. I helped her climb up the side of the draw, and we sat down on the edge and tried to clean the bark out of my sister's palms, which only intensified her crying. 
when suddenly we both heard what we thought was someone running down the draw next to the one that we were in. Though we both looked in the same direction at the same time, neither one of us saw anything. After some time, I was able to get her to calm down a bit, and we started to walk back to our house. We were moving slowly and had walked only a few minutes when we heard something walk a short distance away from us, though we kept turning around to look and never saw anything. Being kids, this made us pick up our pace, which was matched by whatever was following us. As we approached the edge of the woods, I told my sister to run, which we both did. However, at the edge of the woods was a small rock face, about twice as tall as we were, that we had to climb down. I climbed down first, but my sister couldn't climb down, so I climbed back up to help her, and we were both kind of stuck for a few minutes. Finally, my sister calmed down and started to slowly climb down the rock, and I snuck back into the woods a short distance to see if I could see anyone, since we had not heard anything for a while. I peeked over a small rise and came face to face with a small, hairy individual about the same size as me, which was less than five feet at the time, who was down on his hands and knees. We made eye contact at the same time, and it had a look of surprise on its face. Its head jerked up and his eyes widened. We looked at each other for probably only a second or two when it raised its arms up and grabbed a hold of a sapling as if to pull itself up. And I can't get the image of its black fingers wrapped around the sapling out of my mind. This movement caused me to turn around in horror and run to the rock face where I jumped off without stopping, knocking my sister to the ground. When we got back to our house, we told our parents who thought we had seen a bear, which may have been attracted to my sister's crying. To be honest, we had a couple of encounters with black bears the previous year. It was from these bear encounters, however, that I was able to determine that what I saw was no bear. The closest animal I could relate it to would be a sloth with long arms, a pug face, dark brown in color, though at that age I didn't know what a sloth was or, for that fact, a Bigfoot. The second encounter, about four years later, was more vocal than visual. My neighbor had thought that I had been in the woods behind his house, climbing trees and shaking branches. This was witnessed by him and his mother. When he asked me about it, I told him that it wasn't me, and I asked him to show me where it was. We got to the location and did not see anything and continued our trek further up the hill and deeper into the woods. We were just about to crest the ridge of the hill when, from the top of the ridge, came a very loud growl slash howl, followed by a deep, loud grunt. This was followed by a shaking of two trees, which were about four inches in diameter, much bigger than a sapling, but not big enough to cut for firewood either. Though these trees were not big, you could tell it would take a lot of force to make them move like that. As this was happening, I looked at my sister, who was frozen in what could only be described as sheer terror, which meant to me that it was no joke, and something very real or very big was up there. I decided to make a run for it and was quickly joined by my neighbor. Once we started running, though, the noise and shaking stopped. My neighbor would never talk about the event after that, and it would be years before I could get him to go into the woods. But he would never go past where he was able to see his house. Again, once I told my dad, he thought it was a bear, and when I showed him the location, he could see a lot of disturbance on the ground, but no tracks. The next notable incident happened over a span of a fall and spring seasons of my freshman year. Due to a certain circumstance, I would be left off the bus at the beginning of the road I lived on and would walk the rest of the way home. 
After a couple of weeks of this, I thought I was hearing someone walking parallel to me up on the hill in the woods. Occasionally, I would have other individuals walking home with me, and they would also hear it, but they thought I was trying to scare them. What troubled me the most about these incidents was the fact that the following would start at the same location and end at the same location every time. I don't recall it ever missing a day. After several attempts at trying to see this individual, I would only catch flashes of light brown colored fur or the movement of bushes and limbs. When I told my dad about this, he again looked for signs of someone messing around, but found nothing. My dad made inquiries with a couple of local backwoods farmers in the area, and they assured him that they had not been in that area and that they too have been noticing signs of someone messing around. The following spring, I had the opportunity to miss school for a week, so I took the chance to see if I could get a better look at this thing. I sat on a set of railroad tracks that ran parallel with our road, though a couple hundred yards away, and watched a couple of my neighbors walk home from the bus, let off up the road at their houses, I had taken a small variable spotting scope with me and it was very light and I could see through the foliage. I could also see through most of the underbrush. I did not see anything following them. After they had passed the point where the following stopped, I started to work my way down the tracks towards the trail that led to my house. Upon looking back at this point where I thought the following stopped, I caught movement about three-quarters of the way up the hill. I could tell with the naked eye that it was a human-type individual. It was moving limbs out of the way with its hands while traveling up the hill. By the time I found it in the scope, it had crested the ridge, and I could only see the back of it from the waist up. It did not appear massive like a typical Bigfoot, I thought it was about the same size or height as I was, six foot at the time, though it was broad in the shoulders and had very long arms. I was unable to see its hands. The hair color and length was that of what you would expect to see on a brown bear, almost a dark blonde and not real long. I was only able to watch it for a short time before it disappeared over the ridge. When I told my dad about the incident, he assured me it was someone messing with me and to try not to confront them and to start riding the bus all the way home from now on. The last incident I had was the next fall. I believed it was about 1986. I had just started deer hunting and this was the first year that I was allowed to go into the woods alone carrying a gun. I had set up well before daylight on the top of the same ridge as mentioned earlier. It was still quite dark out and I was sitting on a milk crate at the base of a big tree. I heard st something start walking towards me from the end of the ridge. It was very cold out and the leaves were crisp. As it grew closer, I could tell there were two of them and that the walking sounded like two small kids walking and trumping through the woods. I could tell they were not deer. They stopped just short of me being able to make them out if they, have, if they had spotted me. And I didn't hear any further movement from them until something else came down the ridge towards us a few seconds later. I could tell this thing was walking on two legs and sounded much larger than the other two. It reached the area the other two were at and then stopped. They remained silent for what I felt like was several minutes until the two smaller ones started walking back in the same direction they'd come from. Only this time, they did not zigzag. They kept in a straight line. The larger ones stayed motionless until the other two were almost out of hearing range. And then it started walking back the same way the other two did. It walked away at the same pace it had approached and then did not seem to be startled or scared, but I believe they knew I was there and was intentionally avoiding me. Another Bigfoot sighting occurred at Olive Hill on October the 12th, 2014. 
It was at 6 a.m. and the witness was sitting on the back deck of his secluded cabin on Sand Ridge Road. He had been told that there were some monster bucks in the woods and had previously set out a salt lick near his pond in hopes of drawing the deer in close enough to get a glimpse of them. He was sitting there quietly when a large object came into view about 40 yards away, walking across his property from left to right. At first, he thought it was a bear, as they had been seen in in the area on previous occasions, but then he saw the figure was walking upright and carrying the block of salt in his hands. It kept walking without hesitation, never turning in the witness's direction until it disappeared into the woods. He described it as being seven feet tall and covered with dark brown hair. It had a conical head, like a primate, he said, and big muscular arms. It also had a four-foot-wide shoulders and arms that were longer than most humans. The part of his face that he had been able to see was a dark and hairless. He had been hearing strange noises coming from the woods late at night, and for some time before the incident, but had written them off as coyotes. The cabin is surrounded by 2,000 acres of dense forests. On November 11, 2013, Tabitha Stagel and her son were outside their home in Grand, Kentucky, when they heard a bizarre noise, like a siren coming from the woods. But it was no siren, Stagel dashed into the house and grabbed her cell phone. Once back outside, she succeeded in recording several of the strange vocalizations and later sent them to a local Bigfoot research group who concluded that they were likely from a Sasquatch. But Stagel already knew this. She'd encountered the creatures in the area before in the late 1990s. Grand County lies on Route 182, east of Olive Hill, and southwest of the county seat of Grayson, and it's very sparsely populated, with less than 200 people living in town. I have heard stories all my life, Stiegel said, mostly from the road I grew up on, about two or three miles from where I live now. Everything from peeking in a trailer window in 1990 to chasing my aunt in the 60s. My dad and mom also heard it scream in the late 90s, and my best friend's dad heard it scream just last June. Her first brief sighting of the creature she felt was responsible for making the unsettling shrieks happen when she was a teenager in the late 1990s. She was throwing out scraps for the horses after dinner one night, when she observed a large, dark figure standing in the field about 40 feet away. It was a big, man-looking thing, she said. It looked like a Neanderthal. I actually spent three years thinking it was a ghost of a Neanderthal. It was just standing there in the moonlight, completely still, watching her. She screamed and ran back inside to tell her dad, but by the time they came out to look for it, With a gun and flashlight in hand, it was already gone. Her second sighting occurred just a short time later on February the 8th, 1998. In February of 1998, we had a huge ice storm, she wrote. I remember it so well because my sister had got hit by a car on February 2nd and only suffered a hurt leg, thankfully. And the storm came later that night. We lost power for six days. Everything we had in the deep freeze went bad, and my dad had stacked it up and put it outside to throw out later. We had to cook out with a grill to feed my family all week. I think the smell of the spoiled food may have drawn him in. That night, the electricity came back on, and me and my dad were watching TV, and the porch light was on. I glanced at the window and saw what looked like a man carrying our bag of meat. And that's when I screamed. Some man is stealing our rotten meat. I saw it run up the steps, and it had black, hairy legs. I could see the hair was attached to the body as it moved. I don't know if I would say I saw muscles, but more so it wasn't saggy. Anyway, the porch light didn't light up the whole steps, 
so it was gone and out of sight pretty quickly. My dad and me jumped up, and we could hear it crashing through the woods about fifty feet up in the woods, and then it was silent. I'm assuming it jumped a fence and went into the neighbor's cow field, where it would make less noise while making its escape. The next morning, her dad found the bag and all the meat was gone, but the butter and the french fries were still in the bag. The bag was opened, as if by hand and not torn or shredded as it might be expected of an animal or any description that had come into its possession. I feel pretty lucky to have seen what I've seen, she stated, but I don't know if luck has anything to do with it when you live in Gran. I think we are surrounded by them. I think she may be right. On February 24th, 2011, another Carter County woman, this time over in Grayson, claimed that she and her husband had seen a similar creature one evening as they were returning to their home on Everman's Creek Road, and it had scared them to death. The sighting took place at around 10.45 p.m. during the heavy rainstorm that lasted about eight seconds. My husband picked me up from work about 10.25, she later told an online investigator. The rain was so bad and we were driving slow when we pulled onto our road. We topped Crawford's Hill and just below the hill after you passed Miss Crawford's old home, we saw something that scared us to death. My husband was driving an extended cab truck, and from where I was sitting, whatever it was, was standing eight feet tall with long arms stretching out and grabbing the trees to pull itself up. It was on the right-hand side of the road. We were too scared to stop at that moment. I wanted to go back and take pictures. I have always been told stories of creatures here on this road. A lot of people have seen it. It was standing only 30 feet from her side of the truck. She described it as dark brown in color and massive. As it grabbed the tree and pulled itself up to the roadside embankment, its long dark hair was wet and matted from the rain, hanging down about six inches from the figure's huge arm, which resembled an orangutan. It had its back to the two witnesses and its head was hunched down low, like it was trying to hide its face from the vehicle lights. While speaking with the investigator, she also confessed that she had seen another such creature in the area years before when she was about 11 years old. It was standing motionless beside the road as her and her future husband drove by. Unlike the aforementioned incident, the creature was covered in solid white hair. Both witnesses claimed to know several other people who have encountered these things in the area as well. Our final Carter County case involved an entire family, which included five young children, who endured years of terrifying brushes with the unknown, including large, man-like creatures, which always seemed to stay just out of sight. The following testimony is from one who lived in such a place. The time was 1980 to 1983, the location six miles east of Grayson, Kentucky, Carter County on U.S. 60 and State Road 207. I lived in Carter County, Kentucky, in a small community named Rush. I lived in a small hollow with a partially graveled lane that dead-ended at my driveway this land is hills with pine oak and other common eastern Kentucky trees and brush growth. The land has strip mines with several ponds scattered through it. There are houses and small family-type farms. In 1980, we, my wife and five children, moved to the undeveloped 50-plus acres that belonged to my wife's father until his death in 1973. We have lived here for about two to three months when I started hearing things that made me a little uncomfortable, but not frightened. There were nights the dogs would bark and carry on, but would not go after whatever it was they were barking at. And we, the entire family, would even run and hide when it came too close to the house. I asked a couple of neighbors, and they would not discuss it, saying it was just a deer or a bear. 
Yes, there were deer and even a bear killed within a mile or so of the area. But any type of hunter would know that this is very unlikely. I hunted and walked in the woods a lot just to enjoy the cool temperatures of the forest and to just be out alone. While I was hunting, I noticed a few things that wasn't what I call natural forest happenings. I had not heard of markers of Bigfoot territory, but I had saw what I thought was the work of a few local boys out in the woods playing. But as I looked at the three large trees that were leaned on one another to form a teepee structure without a covering, the question always came to my mind, why would anyone want to drag those trees up to here and lean them on another tree? You could see they were not a natural fall or accident. It was a deliberate structure that was constructed by someone. There were also small trees that were almost twisted in two at about four to six feet off the ground. These were not caused by the wind, but by using two hands to twist as you would to wring out a cloth. I never saw any footprints but once, when the dogs were acting up at something in the woods about 28 yards up the hill, I went after it with a thirty thirty rifle. It was about 11 o'clock at night in the early winter or late fall. There was a skift of snow on the ground, mostly in spots on the hill. After I walked around the hill for over a mile, not getting any closer or even able to see what I was after, even though it stayed about 20 to 30 yards ahead of me, I could not see it, but I could hear it walking in the leaves and breaking branches. I decided to just go on to the house. The next morning, I walked up the hill to see what kind of tracks I could see. I found my tracks in the snow, but I couldn't find any indication of anything that was walking in front of me or around me. I have seen eyes that look blood red and another time green as they were looking at me from low underbrush at night. While sitting on a porch at night, I would hear what... At the time, I thought sounded a little like an old steam locomotive whistle, but not quite the same. They were always a long way off in the hills. My wife at the time saw what she described as an old Indian man looking through the window at her. I was not there at the time, but she did call the Kentucky State Police. There were no footprints, so they said she probably saw her own reflection, and I guess I just dismissed it. She said she saw it from the mid-chest up. The bottom of the window was at least six feet, six inches off the ground. I'm six feet tall, and I had to use an eight-inch block just to see over the bottom edge of the window. One night, while we were leaving to go to Ashland, Kentucky, as we were getting into the truck, we heard someone on the hill whistling. I called out to see who it was, but there was no reply. Just more whistling. I told them I had a gun and I would shoot if they didn't answer. There was still no answer, so I fired a shot in the general direction and the whistling stopped. There was no reply, but I just started to walk around the hill. I fired another shot in the air, but it didn't speed up or slow down. I got in the truck and we left. I never had a sighting, but all these things and a few more such as throwing rocks and pieces of wood, has convinced me that there's something that's intelligent enough to stay so close and still so undetective is living within our backyards. My son and his girlfriend claim to have had a visual of it about three or four years ago. The witness claimed that about 30 or more residents that he knew of had witnessed the thing, but he could get none of them to talk about it. Nevertheless, he did say the children of the family, just two blocks down the street, had been badly frightened one night when they saw a giant monkey looking at them through the kitchen door. And another local youth claimed that he had for some and some friends were camping one night. They had heard someone walking around their tent. Before they could get a look to see who the intruder was, the entire tent them inside was picked up and thrown 10 feet through the air. Another Carter County resident, J.S., 
claims to have had several sightings of the elusive creature in 2003 at the Carter Cave State Resort National Park, including one of a solid white-colored creature. He describes them as nearly 10 feet tall and muscular, but not real massive like the Patterson-Gimlin creature. The creatures, he's claimed, walk on two legs with a massive stride of at least six feet or more. Well, guys, I think I'm going to stop there. It's been a really long video. Well, for me, you know, <laughs> I enjoyed this a lot. Uh, I love these stories. I can't get enough of them. And I wish you guys would go and check them out at least. Um, I'll leave a description. There are links in the description box. You can go check them out. And if you, uh, they're really inexpensive to buy, I would uh, at least go check them out. Okay, guys, you know I love you. Please be kind and take care of each other. And remember to take care of yourself. You all have a really great evening. And don't forget to hit that like button. And don't forget to send in your stories. I hope to see you back here in a couple of days. Bye-bye for now.